Sublimation. Um, sublimation is the transition from a solid directly to a gas. Um, if we think about um, a, a block of ice, here's an illustration of a block of ice. The water molecules in the ice have thermal energy. Each of them is vibrating around a fixed point, just like you guys are breathing and moving and fidgeting in your chair. You're all fixed relative to each other, but you're moving. There's an average kinetic energy that is related to the temperature of the ice, but it's only an average. Just like some of you are moving more than others, some of these water molecules have more kinetic energy than others do. And so if we have an atom at the surface, that, or a molecule, I mean, a molecule at the surface that has enough energy, it can break loose and go directly from the solid state into the gas state. And that's called sublimation. Deposition is the opposite situation where we have gas molecules going directly to the solid without becoming a liquid first. So solids also have vapor pressures. Sublimation will usually occur at a greater rate in an open container because the gas molecules that are formed escape and so we don't have any coming back. Sublimation explains a few things that you may have noticed occurring in the freezer in your kitchen. Have you ever noticed that if you leave ice cubes in the freezer for a long time, they get smaller over time? What's going on with that? Well, the ice is subliming. The water molecules on the surface of the ice cubes over time are escaping into the gas state. It's too cold for them to melt, but some of them have enough energy to just get out of there and they'll escape. Ice crystals form inside airtight bags of frozen food. Notice this a lot with like hash browns or tater tots, french fries. You pull them out, you dump them on the pan, and there's like this big pile of ice crystals. Who, who wants ice in their frozen french fries? What a dumb idea. We didn't put that in there. It's the water that was in the food, frozen, that is subliming. It's going into the gas state in the bag of french fries. It can't get away. Eventually, it will condense and make ice crystals somewhere other than inside the french fries. And this is a source of foods getting freezer burned. They dry out and get nasty after a while because the water leaves. Well, if the water can't leave, then the food won't get freezer burn as fast. And so if you either use a deep freeze where the temperature is significantly colder than a regular freezer, or you seal food in with no air space, then you can reduce the freezer burn that occurs. And this is how like the seal a meal things work. They suck all the air out, so there's no air space for the gas molecules to go. And so then they tend to stay in the food. Dry ice. Dry ice is solid carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide doesn't melt, it just sublimes. This is why they call it, this is why they call it dry ice, because there's no liquid, there's no wetness. So here's the cold uh, carbon dioxide, the solid carbon dioxide, and it just goes directly into the gas state without melting at all. The reason we see this vapor trail stuff, that's not us seeing the CO2 gas. But as that gas escapes, it's cold, and so it causes the water in the air to condense into like a fog. Um, fusion is melting, going from a solid to a liquid. This is more common. If we increase the temperature of that block of ice, the molecules vibrate, vibrate faster. And when they get to the melting point, they have enough thermal energy to partially overcome the intermolecular forces and slide around and they can get into the liquid state. So melting or fusion refers to a trans transition from solid to liquid. The opposite transition is called freezing, that's going from a liquid to a solid. So what we see is as we increase the temperature of a solid, here this would be ice, um, when it gets to the melting point um, the temperature will not change. It will stay at zero degrees 
until all the ice has melted. Because even though we're adding heat to it, all of the heat that's being added, all of the energy that's being added is going into more molecules breaking loose so they can slide around, more melting. And so that the temperature doesn't go up until all of the melting has, has finished. Um, when you're adding more heat, it'll cause it to melt faster, but it won't get warmer. So anytime you have a solid and it's liquid together, you can know that the temperature is the melting point. So that's one of the reasons that zero degrees Celsius is so popular for chemical experiments. You don't need a, a thermostat or a heater or a refrigerator or anything to control the temperature. If you put your, your reaction into an ice water bath, you know what the temperature is. It's zero. Anytime the solid and the liquid are together, the temperature will be zero. Well, melting is an endothermic process. This makes sense to us because if you want to melt, melt a block of ice, you have to put energy into it, right, to heat it up. Heat of fusion is delta H, again, with the subscript FUS for fusion as opposed to VAP for vaporization. The heat required to melt one mole of a solid. So to take one mole of water from solid to liquid requires 6.02 kilojoules per mole of energy. Melting is endothermic, therefore freezing has to be exothermic. This is not intuitive. When something freezes, it releases energy. What? It doesn't make a lot of sense. What is your freezer doing, though? Why is there the compressor on the back, and what is it doing? It's pumping heat energy out of the inside of the box because freezing is an exothermic process. As it freezes, it releases energy. That energy needs to be taken away for the freezing to occur. This makes more sense in Reedley, but I think you guys know a little bit about this. In the winter around here, the farmers have to be concerned about the citrus crop because if the temperature gets too low, the oranges will freeze. There's a couple of things that they can do to help protect their crop. And one of them is they water the field. They'll get the field really wet, sometimes even just standing water in the field. Because what happens is, as that water starts to freeze at 32 degrees Fahrenheit, zero degrees Celsius, it releases energy into the air. And the temperature stays at 32 degrees Fahrenheit until all the water has frozen. For the oranges, they just need to keep the temperature above 26. So 32 is just fine. And then they throw in some big wind machines to blow the warmer air down by where the water's freezing around to keep the trees from freezing. It's chemistry. The heat of fusion is usually a lot less than the heat of vaporization. And this is because in order to melt something, you don't have to completely break the intermolecular forces. They're still touchingly close. They're still interacting with each other. You just have to loosen them up a little bit. So it doesn't take as much energy to melt something as it does to vaporize it. So this is a graph comparing heats of fusion in the blue to heats of vaporization in the purple or whatever color that is. And you see heat of vaporization is much higher. So we can put all these ideas together in what's known as a heating curve. And this is a new section, so I should start a new video.